I didn't love the underwriting. I didn't love the capital raising. Let me push those off. I love the asset management. What's going on, everyone? Vinny Celeste here. We're going live to another Cash Flow Digest episode Friday. Justin, thanks very much for joining us. I'm so excited to be here, Ben. Thanks for having me, man. Asset management takeover. Let's go. So I, I kind of want to get into something with you. I don't always have the chance to ask. So could you tell us all your story about how you became one of the managing partners at the Rosa Group, how you all met and how this opportunity came to be? Sure. Yeah. Happy to do. I started off investing 10 years ago now, more in, in Trenton, New Jersey, bought a, got a new job and uh, was making a little bit more money and started Googling, you know, where do, where do I put this money? What should I do? Should I buy Bitcoin? Should I do this, that probably should have bought the Bitcoin, but here I am. Yeah. Yeah. Either way, yeah. here I am. And I, I found, you know, rental real estate, found bigger pockets and, and started going through the podcasts and went, went out and bought a rental property. And so I bought a house for a four bedroom house in New Trenton, New Jersey for $81,000. And it was my first rental. I self-managed it. I learned how to rent for 81 Vinny and the rent was 1250. Okay cash flow right but it's trenton new jersey so in theory on paper it was cash flow but you know the check was lost in the mail and you know all the problems that, that came with self-managing newbie and all that but i needed help so i went to the local meetups and that's where matt was running the meetup and he was flipping houses and renting properties and all that and you know we just kind of kind of connected there i added value in some ways I, I volunteered at the meeting, stacking chairs, checking people in, just trying to be around the guys that were doing things that I wanted to get invited to the after meeting drink table, right? There was a table of like the dude, the speaker and like the guy running the meeting and like the people that had a lot of experience. And my goal was like, okay, how do I get invited to that meeting, right? How do I get to sit in on that table? And so hanging out, like I said, checking people in, stacking chairs, being around, being there every time, just adding value where I could. And eventually, you know, got invited to the table and started, you know, making relationships with people, buying a few more rental properties and eventually took over the meeting. And so I was, I was then running the, the meetup. I had taken over from Matt. Matt was wanting to step down and, and build, build the business a little bit, but I had Matt come back to speak a, a little while later. He was talking about a, a 49 unit deal he had just closed and the sort of step-by-step -step process. And I'm like, man. I'm a project manager. I, I could manage these people. I could figure this out. I should be able to go buy it. If he can do it, I can do it. I can figure this out, right? Even though I only have three single family houses, I flipped a house, I did a wholesale, not a huge real estate portfolio, but I'm like, I'm gonna go buy a 50 unit and figure this thing out. So I went and called some brokers and hopped in the car, drove down to Virginia, went to go tour a 96 unit property. And the broker's like, dude, who, who are you? You have three houses. Why, why would I show you this, you know, three and a half million dollar property or whatever? And uh, good point, right? Why would you? <laughs> Who am I? I've got no experience in this kind of space. So I went back to Matt and I said, look, I'm, I got the job. I can qualify for the loan. I make decent money. I've got a network. I can raise the money, but I need, I need some experience on the team because I'm, I'm sitting here with, you know, three, three houses. So Matt, you know, who I had known for a while said, Hey, you know what? I'll come in with you. We negotiated that if I find a deal, then he gets a piece of my piece. He gave me his blessing to, to use his name and his his expert, his, his track record. And so now I was telling brokers that we, instead of had three units, had 203 units and we looked a lot stronger, didn't we? So we were going to tour properties and, and buy them, even though it was me and I was doing the groundwork and I was taking the vacation days and all that. So eventually found, bought a 40 unit in Virginia, syndicated the deal, raised the money, got a manager in there, you know, Matt um, talked me off the ledge a few times and was there for to provide support and everything, uh, which is great. And then three months later, I got laid off from my job. So all this elate, elation and excitement, and then they pulled the plug on the whole team and, and let everybody go. So I was trying to decide, should I uh, go find another job? Stable option. By the way, baby number two on the way here. So no pressure, but my wife's like, hey, you know, you got only a little bit of time here. You got to make some money. And so I was looking for a job, but she's like, you know, take, we looked at how much runway we have. She's like, take two months and see if you can go buy another apartment complex and we'll use that fee to keep us going and you'll buy another one. And so I was, that, that was kind of the plan. I was hanging around Matt's office and he was complaining about this, some problems he was having in, in Fayetteville, North Carolina, on some of the properties that, that we were looking at or that, that he had. And he's complaining about, you know, getting down there and this and that. And I'm like, hey, I'll drive. I got nothing to do, right? Let me drive. You want to work in the back, work in the back. I'll drive down, chat, you know, and see if I can add value when, when we get down there. And so we got down to Fayetteville, you know, through that time, he had basically, we had figured out. So 
we landed the property or we get down there. Matt goes one way to deal with a, a manager issue. I go the other way to deal with the contractor stuff the whole day. I'm like out dealing with contractors, like literally a shoebox full of receipts kind of stuff, helping him write, figure out his invoices. Like everything was a mess. Nothing was organized. This management company really didn't know what they were doing. So I was just going in really from my, my project management background, adding value, keeping, getting things organized. And so they will do that. But we kind of got together at the end of the night. <clears throat> I'm like, here's all the things I did, right? <laughs> Dumpster's getting empty. This contractor's good. Here's the invoices. Here's the money you owe, but he gave us credits for X, Y, and Z. I inspected these units. They're rent ready. These other ones need some, some work. Like just kind of ran through the property and, and got all this stuff done. And so we kind of realized like Matt's superpower, finding deals, raising money, attracting a lot of attention, not so great, admittedly about the details, about the managing of the people and about driving the business. And so we really very quickly realized like, let me come in, bring my project management experience, help out where I can on this one project and we'll see what, what happens. So Matt and his other partner at the time brought me in. We negotiated some equity in the project for me, some fees, and that became my my thing. That was uh, what I focused on. And so I would hop in the car and drive down to Fayetteville every two weeks for, for a while. We started to turn it around. And then by the next year, we started buying some properties out in Kentucky. And so we picked up DC9, DC10, all out in Kentucky. And so we, we started to build like a little thing that was snowballing, right? And so in the beginning, it was me getting at it. Oh yeah, we'll bring Justin onto this. And then I kind of became more and more, okay, we're gonna do another one together. We're gonna do another one together. And so I started adding more value, adding more value, adding more value, just seeing where I, where I can contribute, right? Uh, and then we get into 2020, COVID, Diamond Ridge comes along in October of 2020. And by that point, we kind of really formed up. It's been a few years. This is working. We figured out our superpowers, like our multifamily superpower assessment, right? Where we're mats of the money. I'm the hammer. We had a brain on the team. We had the hunter on the team. So we started just adding, finding the right people. And we realized like we can all be stronger together. And so from there on, you know, that was it. We're we partnered up and formalized things and hit the ground running. And here we are now, a few years later. I wanted people to hear that because I feel like that's that's a situation that a lot of us find ourselves in, especially getting started here that you know you have offer, you know you have skills and you're able to contribute to this business. But finding folks that have the need and with complementary skills, that's difficult, right? And so really understanding what you can contribute to the, the business will let you try to find partners that have the need for that. Guys, we have a superpower assessment. It does uh, a lot with what Justin was just describing. It, it, it's a fun little quiz. It only takes you know five minutes and it'll identify you know, maybe some of your skills that you can provide to a multifamily superpower team. So five years out, could you project, could you tell us a little bit how this model of having, you know, one solid team of all these superpowers going out, you know, doing deals, what has that done for the portfolio acquisition wise? Yeah, I want to talk about like, there's a difference between doing deals, which is me coming into that Fayetteville deal was us doing a deal together, right? We're filling each other out. Okay. We're going to get in on this project. And then at some point, like a, a switch flipped and it's like, okay, we're not individuals doing a deal or a company we need an investor relations guy right we need marketing we need you know someone to, to onboard our investors and to handle this and that and then we need we need you know all the other things that maybe another asset manager and okay maybe we need some vas to help us with our social media and so all of a sudden instead of individuals doing deals we realized oh no, there's actually a company here and so so you know i think that a lot of people the first inclination is find people do deals. And, and I think that's a good start, but we, what, what we've been talking about lately and, and from our experience is, you know, think in the long term. think for the long run, is this a company we're building? Because it's so easy to say, oh, we're going to buy this deal and there's going to be acquisition fees that come in and we're going to split them up and we're all going to run our separate ways. Well, right. who's going to run the asset? Who's going to talk to the investors? Who's going to write the updates? Who's going to control the capex? Like, you can't just buy a deal and run different directions. You have to buy the deal and operate it. You're building and buying a business. When you buy a multifamily property, you're buying a business. So you need to have a plan for who's going to run that business. How are we going to run that business? What is everyone's roles and responsibilities? And so I see a lot of folks just kind of saying, oh, I want to partner up with somebody. I can bring money or whatever. It's like, no, figure out how do we have complementary skill sets, right? Me, Matt, and everybody all have complementary skill sets where we add value to this company in different ways. And so we're able then to hire out even the other gaps that we have. And so we recognize what each of us are really good at, our superpowers, right? But then we also recognize where we have some faults. I'm extremely happy that Matt can be over here raising money and, and doing all that. That's, you know, I can do some of that, but I'd much rather run my people, run my process, run my teams and and go implement the business plan and and then everybody's over there you know pounding down doors and, and working on acquisitions and it's a tough time to be in acquisitions but everybody's the guy for it right he's got that that build that mentality for it and so together we all add value to to this thing and you know it's become this much greater 
entity because of it, because we're all contributing to this business. We're not looking at it as we're doing a deal and then going off to do something else. We're doing a deal in service of building a business and building a company that will continue to live on and be bigger than the sum of the three of us and be able to employ great people and, and add value to really transform lives through real estate, right, Vinny? So I'll, I'll hit that tagline in there. But you know, that's that's really what we mean, right? We're able to build something that serves not just us, but but the everyone from the residents to the contractors to the staff members at our properties through our investors and through the people that get to work for our company as well. That's great. Yeah, it, that is something that we talk a lot about with students that we're consulting and that sort of stuff. It, it seems like a very common approach to find a good opportunity and then figure it out, right? You're going to assemble the team after you find mm-hmm. the opportunity. You have different gaps and different needs for that to make that deal work. But there's definitely a difference between, you know, having deals build the business or the business you know, project out these deals and having deals come to the business as a result of your systems and processes working, you know, yeah, so there's a different. Yeah. Awesome. Absolutely. In that regard, you know, building businesses and that sort of stuff for folks starting out, there's a constant debate that, you know, we're always talking to people about, which is the differences between self-management, property management, and, and, and you know, or hiring a third party property manager. Yeah. What it's, I know you have to give us a caveated answer here. But what what words of advice would you give for someone you know making that decision of of self management or third party or and how would that affect your decision on what type of asset you're going to go after? I I was literally having this conversation with one of our accelerator students yesterday because she is is debating the same thing right now. She's looking to scale up her portfolio. Should she self manage? Should she use a third party manager? And so the the answer is you're not going to like it, but it, it highly highly depends on things like your experience level. Things like how many assets you have in the area. If you're going to buy a quadplex across the country and you've got nothing else out there, well, you probably need a third party manager. You probably need someone that's going to be able to be eyes and ears and on the ground for you. If you're buying a quadplex in your town or the next town over and you've got 30 other units in that town, it probably makes sense to self-manage because you're you probably got those systems and processes and contractors and you know, you know the market and you know the area. So there's a lot of gray area in between that. Well, my situation is kind of different, but at the end of the day, it's how are you being most effective with your time, energy, and money? So, you know, if, if we're going to go buy another apartment complex, you know, Benny, Matt for years said, we should self-manage really since those Fayetteville days, you know, we were struggling with the managers, like we should self-manage, we should self-manage. And my answer was always for the longest time, like, what do we know about how, 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 how arrogant of us is it to presume that we will be better managers than this third party company that you know has all this experience. And it wasn't until we hit a tipping point in scale, in market knowledge, in contract relationships that we really felt like, okay, we can do this now. We have the right team, we have the right people that we can plug in here and it makes economic sense. And so now we're moving over to self-management for us, for our company, because that's what works for us right now. But for the last five years, that did not work for us. That was not the right thing for us to do. So every person's situation is gonna be fairly different. I'm a big fan of if you've got a small property, single family, small duplex, and you can self-manage it, I'm a fan of that. I told you with my $80,000 house in Trenton, I went through the ringer, right? And I had every story told to me and every excuse and every problem and a $100,000 insurance issue that came up with. Like I went through the ringer on that property, okay? But I self-managed and I learned hands-on. And so I got that kind of baseline experience and, and look, Managing a four bedroom house in Trenton, New Jersey is not the same as managing a 300 unit in North Carolina. I want to be very clear, but at least grounded me and gave me the context of what some of our managers are going through and gave me some relatability and and understanding empathy for, for how they're going about their day. And what I've realized the more we do this is that the success of our portfolio is incredibly dependent on the success of the people in our offices, the people in the maintenance team that are going into the units and interacting with the staff, the people that are collecting rent and doing the follow-up. These people work incredibly hard for us on our properties. And so it's really important for me as an owner to be able to recognize and, and all their contributions. So when I go to a property, you know, I'm bringing gifts or donuts or treats or something and just very appreciative of like all the hard work and just being able to speak to them about sort of that shared context. I'm like, man, I'm so grateful that you are doing it so that I don't have to do it, but I recognize and appreciate everything you're going through. So I always think that if you can, if you can swing it on the smaller side, it makes sense, especially you're going to want to save some money out of a management fee. But that, you know, look, if you're a dentist and you love being a dentist and you want to pick up a few single family properties on the side, yeah, you probably want a management company, right? So it all depends. Are you trying to build the thing? Are you trying to just invest passively? It was a really long and convoluted answer to your very short question, Vinny. 
I, I no, that's great. It needs to be though, because it's it's a simple question, but it's not a simple you know thought yeah. actually. So what I heard though is, is really two kind of through lines is recognize your your roles and responsibilities and your skill sets. Do you have the ability to and do it well, right? Because this you're we're we're talking about serious business here. So do you have the the ability to to do that management? And then also one thing I pick up is is what type of asset do you want to invest in? Proximity to your other assets and that sort of thing. There's a certain economies of scale that makes this a, an effective business strategy or model. So we, we need to not only take into account the individual, the person, and and what you want to do, but also the type of asset you want to take down and and where you want to take it down. So I'll just tell you for, for me, that's one of the reasons we got connected and why I got interested in multifamily. But one of the reasons I think it's so great is because frankly, I didn't want to do everything, right? And when you resort yourself to not wanting to do everything, you need to do bigger deals and create a bigger slice of the pie. So to facilitate these types of partnerships. And that's why I got interested in large multifamily because actually I wasn't interested in at all in the asset management side of it. I didn't want to, have to think about it. So when you start thinking about along those lines, well, how large does the deal need to be to justify either an asset management uh, partner who's going to do that or a third party property manager. And that will kind of, you know, facilitate what type of deal you're looking for and, and where as well. So, yeah, absolutely. And so we found, you know, with the hunter brain money hammer kind of ethos there, you know, if you're a money guy and you want to just be doing money and interacting with people, great. You got to find people that can, can help you out with, with the other things, right? Maybe you're two of them, but you need help with the other two. Right. You know, when I did my 40 unit mini, I was all four. Right. Yeah. And very, very quickly realized I'm not an underwriter. I'm not a brain, you know, and I struggled with the capital raise, you know, and I really picked a market of like, it was, it was eight hours away from my house. It was driving distance and I could get there with one vacation day from my work. So it was like, I literally drew a circle on the map, like anywhere within here is going to be fine. Cause I can get there. Right. So it wasn't the best, you know, I probably, I wouldn't do it quite the same now, but I recognize that there's other people that have better skill sets than that, than me in those areas. And I can focus on what I'm good at and I can, and I can contribute more with, with what my superpower is, but evaluating yourself can be hard. A lot of people think they have to do everything. A lot of people think they are good at everything. And, you know, you really have to reflect and, and think about maybe you are, maybe you can do everything. I, I can, I got it done, right? I bought a property. I got us there. But I really think a, a lot about, you know, sort of like a Venn diagram with three, three circles meaning. It's like, what are you great at doing, right? I was a great project manager. I'll say, I'll, I'll pat myself on the back. Very good at like IT, software project management. I was good. The second circle is like, what pays you? Well, my job paid me, right? So I had a great overlap between I was good at it and the job paid me. I was paying my bills. But the third circle is, what do you love, right? And so if you can get the intersection between all three, I wasn't happy. I didn't love software. I'm boring, boring, right? But same thing with multifamily. I didn't love the underwriting. I didn't love the capital raising. Let me push those off. I love the asset management. I'm good at it and it pays, right? So I found this thing that works for my life, for my situation. And so that's what I want everyone to kind of think about combining what they're great at doing, what they love doing, are they going to get rewarded out of, or that feeling of, of, you know, a win at the end of the day. And then how do we pay our bills at the end of the day as well? And so if you can find an intersection between all three of those things, then you're going to do well in life. Awesome. How's that? that? That's yeah, we got, we got, we pushed the envelope of real estate education here and that's personal development. So that's great. I love it. And you know, it's true too, that you have to think about no, no you should do that over the years as well, right? There are, you should recognize the phases of life that you're in. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause there are certain things that we want to do at certain points, you know, or willing to do at certain points that you, you might not be willing to at, at different points of your life. Right. And so that's important to recognize too. And your skill sets will change over time. So it's always marrying those two. You absolutely. Know. You're absolutely right. You could, you could be thinking of the bigger picture and say, Hey, I got to go get this job so I can get these skills so I can get to, to where I want to go. And that's still in service of that greater goal, but getting, getting aligned with what you want out of life will really help you build that. Awesome. Line together. Well, thanks Justin. We got into to talking about superpowers and, how you might fit into a multifamily team and how you can make, maybe make this exit into a full-time career in, in uh, real estate. So really exciting stuff there. And so folks, we spent a lot of time talking about skills and, and how you could fit in these teams. If you want to learn more about where you might fit into a real estate team, head to derosagroup.com forward slash superpowers to, to, find, to take the superpower assessment test and also find out where you might fit in. But if you're looking to take a way deeper dive and really a consultation, head to derosagroup.com forward slash accelerator. We do have a program out there and we're really happy to dive into your business and help implement these systems and processes for you. So thank you everyone for listening and I hope you have a great week. Take Thanks care. Thanks for having me, buddy. Yep. Nice. Yeah. 
Hey guys, Matt Faircloth here. Thank you for listening again to the Cash Flow Digest. I really appreciate you guys doing that. If you guys want to hear more about what DeRosa Group has to offer, go to DeRosa Group, D E R O S A Group.com, DeRosa Group.com online. You can hear about all the great things that we offer from an educational standpoint and passive investment standpoint on our website. See you there. And if you guys want to join our online community, DeRosa Insiders on Facebook, where you can watch this program get recorded every Friday at noon Eastern, and you can come on as even a guest or ask questions on the show. We hope to see you guys on our online community, DeRosa Insiders. See you there.